Go ahead. Uh, for the question, are all death painful for ordinary people? Painful? Yeah. Painfulness? Yeah. yeah, everybody has to experience pain because the body is, is such, it has this nature that it has to get sick. Yeah. When the body gets sick, then there is pain. Yeah. So it's natural. The bodily pain is not harmful to the mind. What is harmful to the mind is the, phys- the mental pain, the pain that arises from the desire to get rid of the physical pain. So the Buddha teaches us to eliminate this desire to get rid of the physical pain because we cannot, because it's beyond our ability. The physical pain has their causes. And when that causes disappear, the physical pain will disappear. So you, what the mind has to do is to live with the physical pain with, when it arises, not try to uh, reject or try to get rid of it. Because when it tries to do that, it creates this mental pain, which is a lot stronger than the physical pain. Once you can control your mental pain, then the physical pain will not cause you any distress. You can live with this physical pain comfortably. So the way to do, to get rid of your mental pain is to get rid of your desire to get rid of the physical pain. And the first method is to use mindfulness, like using a mantra, bhutto, bhutto. When you have physical pain, don't think about it. Forget about it by concentrating on your mantra, bhutto, bhutto, bhutto. If you can continue on with your concentration on your mantra, you will f- forget the physical pain, and you will stop the desire to get rid of the physical pain. So there will be no mental pain then you can live with the physical pain. Your mind will become peaceful and calm. The second level is to use wisdom to study the nature of the physical pain that it belongs to the body. It's not, it doesn't belong to the mind. It affects the body. It doesn't affect the mind. But the mind is delusion, deluded to think that the body is itself. So it thinks it is being affected by the physical pain. So you have to teach the mind that the body and the body are two separate persons. When the body becomes painful, the mind doesn't become painful. But due to the delusion of the mind, the mind thinks it is the body. So it, 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 it dislikes, it wants to get rid of the physical pain. When it wants to get rid of this physical pain, it's creating another pain we call the mental pain, which is a lot stronger than the physical pain. So once the mind knows that the mind is not the body and the physical pain is not the, 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 the pain that the mind experiences, all the mind has to do is just leave the physical pain alone. When there is no desire to get rid of the physical pain, then there is no mental pain. Then the mind can live with the physical pain unaffected. So do I need to have the jhana or samadhi in order to get to have that wisdom? First, yeah. First, you need to have mindfulness to be able to concentrate your mind to have jhana. Mm-hmm. Once the mind has jhana, then the mind will not be affected by the physical pain. But this is a, this is an escape route. Mm-hmm. It's not a it's not a permanent cure. The permanent cure is to face the physical pain and use wisdom to stop the mind from rejecting the physical pain. Once you can stop the mind from rejecting, then the mind will not be affected by the physical pain. So the last question, are life and death predestined? Or, and is it useful to know our past life? Life and death is a process. Once you, there is birth, there will be aging, sickness and death. So if you don't want to have aging, sickness, and death, then you should not have birth. And the way not to have birth is to stop your, all your desire. And knowing past life doesn't help in your, doesn't make any difference to your practice. The only thing it helps is to, rem- to tell you that life is endless, that suffering is endless if you keep continue to re- reborn. 
So if you don't want to have this endless suffering, then you have to stop rebirth. And the way to stop rebirth is to practice meditation so you can get rid of your desire. Okay. So the next question is, I know that living beings take a number of rebirths again and again. How does this life cycle process happen? And where are those other lokas or plane of existence actually located? The plane of existence <coughs> is usually invisible to the physical eye. You can only see it in your meditation. So if you want to see the other worst plane of existence, you have to meditate. When you meditate, you will enter into the, the, the invisible plane of existence. Then you will see all the different level of plane of existence. This is, this is the only way to see, is to meditate. When you meditate, you open your, your inner eye, your mental eye, and you will see the other things that the physical eye cannot see. The, the Buddha can see everything because he meditates. Yeah. So if you want to see everything like the Buddha, you have to meditate. Okay. So is it in this world as well? located in the same world? The mind and the body exist in two different planes of existence. Mm -hmm. The body is in the physical plane. Mm -hmm. The mind is in the spiritual pain. Mm -hmm. plane. It's different level. To see the spiritual plane, you have to enter into, in, you have to meditate. <coughs> also, the question about how does this life cycle process happen? It happens because you have desire to use the body as the means of making you happy. So when you lose this body, you go look for a new body because you still have desire to see, to hear, to, to feel, to touch, to smell, to taste. But if you can get rid of this desire, then you won't need to have a body. Okay. Next question is, if all lower beings are destroyed, where, they, where will they go? Are they all going to higher realms or are they free from rebirth? See, every being has karma to direct them to the various planes of existence. See, when the body of, of every individual is destroyed, the body is not, not the, the, real, the real thing. The real being is in the mind, the, in the spirit, and which it cannot be destroyed. And the spirit or the mind is the one who go and take up different plane of existence. So, so if, if everybody on this earth is killed by a, an atomic bomb, for instance, everybody die, nobody left in this world. But everybody has a spirit, see? And the spirit of everybody doesn't die with the body. And each spirit will then go take up the different level of, of existence according to the karma that they they did in, in, in the past, in, in why they're still living. So the karma is the one that separates the people from different plane of existence. If you do good karma, you go to a higher plane of existence. If you do bad karma, you go to a lower plane of existence. Lower, I mean more suffering. Higher, I mean less suffering, more happiness. And the highest is the Nibbana, in which you have 100% happiness and zero suffering. And the lowest is hell, in which you have 100% suffering and zero happiness. This is the result of your karma, your action of word, speech, and deed, and thought. When you do good karma, you accumulate, you're putting your mind to a higher realm. When you're doing bad karma, you're pushing your, your mind or your spirit to a lower realm. And when you die, then this good or bad karma will direct your mind to go accordingly. But it's all the same thing, the non-physical part of us. We have two parts, physical and the non-physical. The non-physical can be, be named like mind, heart, spirit, ghost, so forth. They are all the same thing with a different label, that's all. This is the one that doesn't die with the body. This is the one that goes to a different realm of existence. 
this is our five jhana when the Buddha explained about the consciousness elements. When you are in a rupa jhana, you are in a higher realm of existence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. See, there are many realms. If you keep the sala, keep the precept, and give dana, you are in the deva realm. If you meditate and you have rupa, brahma rupa, and if you have a rupa, you go higher. And if you have attain to the makapala, you go to the Arya realm, the noble realm, of, the noble disciple realm, which is higher than the. Yeah. And mine are two different things. It's very joyful, but I know it's not right. How to stop this? If you practice, then you will be able to stop your mind. <coughs> the 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 dreams that you have indicates the the ability or the the result of your practice or your good or bad karma. If you have bad dreams, it means you, you do a lot of bad karma. If you have good dreams, you have, it indicates you do a lot of good karma. And if you can stop your mind, then you won't have any dream. You, when you sleep, you will be just, you know, no dreams. That means you have reached Nibbana. You know. But you can still dream sometimes, even if you go to Nibbana, because sometimes you still have some other thing that can come. But usually most of them will be good dreams. Okay, the next question is, from Buddhist value, what is considered to be benefit and unbenefit? Dhamma is the most beneficial thing, and everything else is not beneficial. So the Buddha said, the test of Dhamma excel all tests. Yeah. The delight in Dhamma uh, excel all other kind of delight. Yeah. So we should seek the Dhamma, because the Dhamma gives us the supreme happiness. Everything else gives us supreme suffering. So are these benefit and unbenefit subject to change without conditions? They change according to your ability to create them. If you can create more Dhamma, you get more benefit, more happiness. If you create more defilement, create more gilesa, you are creating more suffering. Okay. 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 So next question. Can followers of other religions which have different be- beliefs and practices develop their mind to reach the state of Nibbana? For example, those who believe that God determines everything. The Buddha said, for people to reach Nibbana, they have to follow the Noble Eightfold Path. If any religion teaches the Noble Eightfold Path, then they can reach that. If they don't teach this Noble Eightfold Path, then they don't get to Nibbana. So the next question, uh, this comment or question is asked based on the poster that we posted. Uh, when you see your husband, you see them as Anichang Dukang Anatta, then you renounce them, him. When you see your money as Anichang Dukang Anatta, then you give it up. So if you see everything as Dukkha, why you should keep anything that makes you suffer? Uh, the question is, the Buddha certainly talked about the benefits and happiness of various companionship and marriage professions. Uh, even monastic life depend on the society <coughs> to meet their needs of life and existence. So is denying these things and the value of society or lay community is in accord with the Buddha's teaching? The Buddha's teaching teaches many levels. Mm. Like in the in educational system, they have different level of teaching. And sometimes the lower level and the higher level might be in conflict. Yeah. So it depends on which level you're in. Mm. Then you stick to that level. If you, are, if you are a householder, you still have husband and wife, you still rely on money, then you live accordingly. For a householder, the Buddha teaches them to be charitable and to be righteous, to have sila. But for those who want higher form of happiness, then they have to renounce this kind of householder life, renounce the householder kind of happiness in order to seek a higher form of happiness, higher f- the happiness that arises from meditation. In order to get, get this, you have to renounce the lower form of happiness, the happiness of having money, ha- happiness of having a husband or wife. 
So they are in conflict, see. So it's, you have to choose between these two kind of level, which level you want. If you still want to have the physical kind of happiness, you have a family, you have money, and you give dana and you keep the precept, then you will have this happiness. If you want a higher form of happiness, then you have to become a, an odd, not a monk or someone, and you have to keep the eight precepts, and then you have to meditate, and you have to renounce the other kind of happiness, the physical happiness. So it, it's no conflict, it's just choice. It's like playing games. Yeah, there are many levels of game you play. You want to play the starter game level, beginner level, the intermediate level, or the advanced level. See? So they, are, they have different rules involved with these different levels, that's all. For monks, we have to renounce the physical happiness, see. But we still rely on the people who have the physical happiness to support us by their charity, by their dana, see. The, the people who have money, they have to give dana because giving dana will make them happy, see. So, so this is how it works. There's no conflict, it's just two different levels of, of happiness. You have to choose which, which level you want. Can a monk refuse food he gets? When, when monks go on Vintabhati, he cannot refuse. He should not refuse as a, as a courtesy. You accept things out of, uh, out of uh, gratitude of people's generosity. But you don't have to eat everything that people give you. You can choose once you have the food in your bowl, which food you want to eat, which food you don't want to eat. But you cannot tell people what you want to eat. Like say, I'm a vegetarian, please don't give me any meat. This you cannot tell people. If people want to keep vegetable and meat together, if you want to just eat vegetable, you just take the meat out. You don't have to eat the meat. But you don't have to tell people what to give. Bakers are not choosers. Okay. Uh, so he gives also example that when two people offer food, one bought pork in the market and cook it, and the other kill a pig to prepare the same dish, so he can refuse. No, if, if, they, if they don't tell you how they get the food, we, we cannot tell them. Mm -hmm. But if they in, intentionally say, I kill this pork to give you the meat, then you say, you must not do this, because it's, you are doing more harm than benefit. You may have the benefit of giving the food, but you are making yourself harmful to yourself because you kill. So as a monk, as a duty, as a teacher, we have to tell them not to do this. But if they go to the market and buy something already died, already dead, dead meat, then it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay, uh, so next question is about dana. When I donate $10, which is about 10% of my wealth, and my friend donated 500 which is a fraction of his millionaire's wealth, do we get the same results? Maybe? No, no. The feeling is different, right? Mm -hmm. When you, you, when you feel you give more, you will feel that you feel better. You, you feel happier. Mm -hmm. If you feel that you give less, you, you feel less happy. Mm -hmm. So it depends on how much you have, the percentage of what you give. So if you are a millionaire and you, you have you have one hundred million baht, and you give one million baht, that's one percent. Mm -hmm. But if you have one hundred thousand baht and you give 10,000 baht, you're giving 10%. So the, the effect on your mind is different, right? It's that you, you give 10%, it's a lot more than giving 1%. So the result is different in the mind. The mind will feel happier for, for someone who gives 10%, even though, even though the amount is not as much as the one who gives 1%. It's not the amount, it's the percentage of what you have that makes the difference to it in your mind. Of the giver. Yeah, it's different. It depends on the percentage of your wealth. Okay. Yeah. But the result of what you give when you come back in your next life, it depends on how much you give. If you give one million, you'll get five million back. If you get, give one hundred thousand, you'll get five hundred thousand back, for instance. So, Even though that's a ten percent? That, yeah, that, that depends on the result that you give. 
So if you get more, you will get more result when you come back. Okay. Mm. So give everything. <laughs> like, like with, with Santara, he gave everything. So when he died, he went to heaven. And after he came down from heaven, became uh, the Lord Buddha, became the Prince Siddhartha. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so next question is about this also dana, that my friend is a person who is not ready to listen to higher Dhamma practice. But he likes to do dana to the monks and temple. But he wishes that he has health and wealth or winning a lottery. So how does this compare to someone who just donate to beggars or animals? Do they get the same merits? Yes, the same merit. The, the more merit you have, is the rest it depends on what you, you desire for. If you give without any desire, you get more merit. If you give and then you have desire to have a return of what you give, then you have less merit. Because sometimes when you don't get what you want back, you feel bad. Instead of feeling good from giving, you, you feel bad. So if you, if you don't have any, any desire to get anything back, then you won't feel bad. You will feel happy. Regardless who, whoever the Right, right. Yeah. It depends on your, your expectation. If you have expectation, the less, the less merit you get. If you have no expectation, you have 100% merit. You feel happy. So the idea is give everything without any... Any expectation for any, any return, any reward. Because when you expect, you have defilement, see? It's lopa, gilesa. And lopa will make you feel unhappy. And it's not giving, it's, it's trading. It's like buying and selling. I give you this, you give me this back, see? Like when you go to the store and you give them the store, or the shop owner some money and he gives you something back. So this is trading, not dana. Dana is a one-way street, giving and not taking. Okay. If you still take, it, it means you're not giving. And the result actually is automatic, right? Yeah, it's in your mind. Right in your mind. Okay. When you sacrifice, you feel good. When you don't sacrifice, you don't feel good. Next question, how to have stillness or calm in the middle of chaotic life, for example, in a highly demanded job or in a busy lifestyle? You have have strong mindfulness, focused on one object in your mind, like the, a mantra, bhutto, 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 or focus on the, the present, on whatever, on whatever you're doing, and forget about everything else. Then everything else around you will not disturb you. But if you have a distracted mind, your mind goes everywhere, think about this and that person, then you bring everything inside your mind and burn yourself. See? The way to do it is to not, let, not to bring anything inside your mind by focusing on one thing. If you're working, just focus on, on your work. You know? or you, you can, if you're not working and your mind starts to bring everything inside, then use the mantra to get rid of them. Bhutto, 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 bhutto then nothing can come into your mind. You block everything by, but, by, by, by reciting Bhutto, Bhutto. Okay. Uh, so how one perceives senses, like the sight, sound, taste, before enlightenment and after enlightenment? Before enlightenment, you have, you have desire for them. Mm -hmm. You have like and dislike for them. After enlightenment, you have no like or dislike or any desire for them. You perceive them just naturally, without having any reaction towards what you, you see or hear. Okay. After, before enlightenment, you have reaction to what you see, what you hear. So the practice is to get rid of this reaction by using sati, samadhi, and panya. Mm. Uh, last question. I have a friend who is very wealthy and devoted Buddhist. However, he has a sister who has a lower IQ. So, uh, even though her sister enjoys a luxurious life of having three helpers to attend to her every day, but yet she's in suffering. So, why is this happening and how? what things to avoid? Because so she, she only gets the support in the physical part, see? Mm -hmm. but she doesn't get any support in the mental part. She needs Dhamma to make her happy inside. She is happy physically, but she is not happy mentally because she doesn't have Dhamma. 
So she has to be instructed to develop mindfulness, develop samadhi, and develop panya. That's the only way to make the mind happy, not the money. But she has a lower IQ, like she can't Then she has to pay for her past karma first. Maybe this life she will not be able to, to develop the mental happiness due to, her, to, due to her past karma that caused her to be uh, incapacitated mentally. So maybe she has to go through more realms of rebirth before this karma disappears, when she comes back to be normal again. Okay, that's all the question today. Okay. All right. Next time, come again when you get more questions. You can post on the, on the page. If anybody wants to any, ask any question, they can post the question. And then maybe once a week you come and ask the question. And we will post it either by the live transmission clip or we can put it on the YouTube. Okay? If there's no question, can I ask for like Dhamma talk in English? Uh, I think there are plenty of uh, dhamma that is already posted, mm. so you can they can go to listen to the old clips in the YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Rupa. Okay. Tani ka tani ka loi. Mi mi kai ya ka tham lai me. Ya tat pe kai ka lai ja